Unitarian Universalist woman chaplain. She served for several army forces in combat zones. She came out from that and has been involved in social justice work in many locations. She was living in the Philadelphia area um, some 10 years ago and quickly joined a contingent that came down to New Orleans and lived in the New Orleans area for a while. At the time, she was staying at the Episcopal Chapel, and she tells me this morning that some of our bridge players invited her to come over uh, to join us for worship services, and uh, she did so and was a member of this church for a while at that time. She has since gone on uh, into it, doing work in education in Mamou, Louisiana, and so we have, as members of this congregation, at certain times uh, taken up collections for them for instruments. I don't know how many instruments we are buying, but we are helping uh, <laughs> to uh, keep their band in instruments. And so it seemed very fitting to have Reverend Dr. DeYoung uh, come here and uh, share a word with us. Uh, and she has been able to do so today, and she will be speaking to us of something that's very interesting and very involved in our history, public education. It's in our bones. Reverend Dr. Marie Dwight. Reverend Jim, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to return to the congregation to offer this message this morning. I also want to thank Elizabeth Carter and all of your members who have been so generous in taking up collections for our Mamu High School Band. Mamu is in a school district that at the time that I uh, joined it was the second poorest school district in the state and subject to DSEG orders going back to the 1960s, as many Louisiana schools had been, they were stripped of a number of fine arts programs in order to meet their DSEG goals to become a unified district, which they have done. This morning, I would like to share a broader message about public education. It's one of my passions. Um, ironically, my first book, that I wrote about life in the military, this woman's army, the dynamics of sex and violence in the military. One of the themes that I had in that book when I left the military in the 1990s was that we can't fix the problems that are going on in the military and now in college universities and on our streets until we fix our public education system, our education system. All of the developmental work that we were expecting the Army to do for soldiers, it needs to be done with children in their earlier years. And since I wrote that book, I was enrolled in the doctoral program and chose to do my research on what it would take, financially of course, to build a healthy school system that would nurture our children in the United States. What what resources would we need? Ironically, when I wrote my first draft of the dissertation proposal, a huge battle ensued in the meeting. Well, if you know me, that's probably, <laughs> you would expect that. Because my first thing actually was broader than that. In my mind, based on my life experience of growing up with DSEG in Philadelphia, in Boston, then in Kansas City, uh, and then experiencing it when I came down here, taught in Philadelphia, taught down here, uh, where so many of the reforms had not really taken place that we had hoped would take place. My first theme was going to be the relationship between 
violence, race, and financial commitments, racial issues and financial commitments, and the success of the public school system. There were some members on my committee who were absolutely stunned. They never told me honestly what they felt. But there was a young vice chancellor of the university who joined the com the, my committee because it was a heavy duty uh, mathematical analysis. And we weren't used to that. <laughs> so, and he just locked horns. He would not let go of the idea that violence should not be an issue to be discussed. Racial equity should not be an issue to be discussed. Only the fiscal inputs. I was so angry when I came out of that meeting. I had come back from Kosovo, done my crops, presented my proposal. Actually, I was down here teaching in New Orleans and flew back for that proposal. I was so angry. I didn't know if I was ever going to graduate. But finally, I decided what most people do in doctoral programs, just do what they say and get it done. And then later on, you can address the other things and narrow it down. But what was interesting to me uh, was that you, the, the Thank you. What was interesting to me was that the young chancellor, when he left the room, he said to me, you can write that dissertation the way you want to write it, but I guarantee you, it will never get passed by this committee. And that's what convinced me I had to back up and now we're down and focus on the fiscal inputs. And I did. And of course, I was able to demonstrate for the state of Pennsylvania, the same thing that is true of Louisiana, New Jersey, all these other states that have equity issues, is that there is a very direct relationship between the local resources that are invested in publication, in, in public education, the state resources, and ironically, there's an inverse relationship between how much money the federal government is putting in. The more federal money that comes in, the lower the, the lower the outcomes. It's very interesting, but we're going to set that aside for now. Over the years, I have been probably engaged in the debate to save and invest in our public schools at a time when there are a number of advocacy groups who are arguing the federal government has no role in public education. Other groups are arguing there is no constitutional right to public education, which in most state constitutions, that right is explicit and well defined. And the fiscal inputs and the nature of the schools is all very, very well defined. But there are even states that are trying to do 